Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Victober, a month-long celebration of Victorian literature. You've probably seen lots of videos to that effect, lots of uh, BookTubers playing around with the major literary classics of the Victorian era or going to some minor classics of the Victorian era, and I want to do that too in the course of October. October is still young, but uh, lately I've been having fun looking around my bookshelves and also Project Gutenberg for Victorians who did not write major or minor classics. They did not write classics of any kind. They were the 90% of Victorians who didn't do that, who still wrote some excellent stuff. The Victorian era was infused with a kind of literary creativity that no other era of human production has ever seen. So even the minor or the also-ran people are often worth finding, especially since they are, if you read ebooks, free. Oh, the whole Victorian era is outside of copyright, so everything is free on Project Gutenberg. Uh, so I did that again uh, last night. I went to my bookshelves this time around, but I found a copy on Project Gutenberg as well, of uh, an author named William Ernest Henley, who wrote a whole bunch of things. He was, like many Victorian writers, he was wildly prolific and also diverse in what he wrote. Plays, poems, speeches, yeah, polemical essays, uh, and... Uh, I concent I'm concentrating this time around on a collection that he did called Essays in Appreciation of Literature, in which he takes literary essays that he had done for the whole of his career and brings them together into one book. Book critics, uh, uh, William Ernest Henley was, he was a book critic for his whole life. He never turned down a check to review a book of any kind, but he was also a book section editor quite a bit. I mean, probably if you asked someone in the Victorian era, I mean, Henley lived from 1849 to 1903. So again, perfectly mapping the Victorian era. Pretty much perfectly mapping the Victorian era. And uh, if you'd asked somebody in his day, if you'd asked one of his many, many literary acquaintances, all of whom are more famous than he is, he knew lots of famous literary people. If you were to ask them what he is, they would probably have said he was a poet before anything else. Long, long down on the list would have been mention of him being a literary editor. Uh, and they would have talked a lot about stage plays, and uh, he had a couple of famous collaborators for his work, and also his poetry. He was very famous for one poem called Invictus. If I can look it up quick on the iPad, we can read it on this video, because it's worth reading. Uh, it'll be dismissed as, by modern-day nihilistic cynics, uh, cynics as uh, just so much syrup. Uh, because all they care about is hurting people, so they don't they don't know anything about anything else, so they're not going to recognize any human sentiments in the poem or anywhere else. <laughs> but uh, he was most famous for that. I think I think if you if you introduced him around the time when this book came out, uh, this this collection came out fairly late in his career. It, if you'd introduced him at a dinner party, it would have been as the author of Invictus, as what we all know uh, him for that poem. But he wrote literary essays his whole life. And he's really, really good. He's really, really good at it. This book is exactly how a literary essay collection should be made. He went through all of the stuff that he did for uh, the Athenaeum or uh, what, or London Magazine or whatever he did, wherever he was writing these pieces. He went through all of them. He did went through the formality of getting the right to reprint these things from his old editors. He could have done it anyway, but he, he went through the bother of getting their permission. Um, and then when he had all the pieces assembled, he brushed them up. He changed them. He says in the introduction to this book that they're basically new anyway, uh, without those permissions. <laughs> uh, and he spans the spectrum here. Oh my, everything from Homer to Shakespeare to Count Tolstoy, uh, Heinrich Heine is in here. Uh, uh, the novels, the literary career of Benjamin Disraeli is covered in here wonderfully. Benjamin Disraeli's literary career gets precious little in the way of critical attention. There was a great book. If I remember, I'll leave a link to my review of it. There was a great book on that subject about uh, 15 years ago. A really good book on that examines Disraeli's literary career. Uh, oh, God, I can't remember. I can't remember the specifics of it. But I will, I will try to find a link to it down below. I'm sure I wrote about it somewhere. Uh, and that's what Henley does throughout this book. He just... He grapples with these literary figures, and there's very little artsy about him. There was very little artsy about him in real life, either. He uh, he lost the bottom half of one leg to tuberculosis. 
And it gave him lots of pain for the whole of his life, even after that operation. In fact, there was talk of taking off an, a part of, an, of his other leg, and he refused. He just said, no, I, it's bad enough as it is. I can put up with the, with the pain if I can find some sort of solution. Uh, and you're going to maybe be recognizing me. I mean, Henley was a big, burly, bearded guy, full of the joy of life, full of a twinkle in his eye, not at all a reclusive or beaten cripple but instead full of life. It's the one thing that everyone who knew him and met him would have said. They would have mentioned his, his leg last on a list. The first thing they would have said is that he filled the room with personality, with vigor. And if that combination of a big, bearded, vigorous personality, a big, bearded, burly, vigorous body, and a artificial leg seems familiar to you, if perhaps those of you who are an older reading generation are thinking of Long John Silver, well, <laughs> it's, it's possible that that connection is correct. <laughs> uh, and so you wouldn't, if you knew the man, you wouldn't expect that his literary judgments would be effete or refined at all. They're brilliant, but they're not uh, delicate. They, he grapples with, these, with the subjects that he's dealing with. And often, all throughout this book, he deals not only with the subjects, but with what other literary critics have said about the subjects. Which is not only thrilling to see, because he pulls no punches, but also invaluable, because most of that stuff is gone from current consideration of these figures. Uh, so that, that is fascinating. <laughs> that is absolutely fascinating to read. I have uh, an example here, just one. Uh, I, I could have picked at, I picked at random here, because this book is full of treasures. Uh, I went to his piece on James Boswell. And uh, I want to read you just a couple of parts from, from Boswell. He starts it off by saying, it, it, it has been Boswell's fate to be universally read and almost as universally despised. <laughs> now, Boswell is not universally read anymore, but when, when Henley was writing that, he was. And he was being universally read and highly esteemed, as a biographer, not as a person, but as a biographer, mainly through a critic, uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay. Macaulay, in addition to writing History of, Rome, of England, he wrote, uh, and also Macaulay was also another literary, Victorian literary figure who was famous for his poetry. We don't remember him for poems now, but once upon a time he was. But in addition to that, he wrote long reviews, and they are gorgeous. They are absolutely wonderful. And he did one on Boswell. He wrote a long treatment about Boswell's Life of Johnson, in which he said, this is the first of biographies and there is no second. But in the course of that essay, he rips Boswell the man apart. <laughs> it just completely eviscerates him. Uh, and in the course of this appreciation of Boswell and this discussion of his Life of Johnson, uh, Henley is also talking about that Macaulay review. Uh, he writes, now Macaulay was the genius of special pleading. Admirable man of letters as he was, he was politician first and man of letters afterwards. His judgments are no more final than his antitheses are dull, and his method for all its brilliance is the reverse of sound. When you begin to inquire how much he really knew about Boswell, and how far you may accept his own estimate of his own pretensions, he becomes amusing in spite of himself, much as, according to him, Boswell was as an artist. To use the uh, the 21st century colloquialism, that is shots fired. <laughs> Babington, Macaulay wasn't around to defend himself, but that's pretty pretty interesting stuff. It'll make you not only go back to Boswell, it'll make you go back to Macaulay. Uh, and he also writes uh, when he, I mean, he's he's talking about Boswell's life of Johnson. He's talking about Boswell, the character in that book. Boswell's not just a biography; he's very much a character in that book. And then he talks about Macaulay's withering assessment of him as a lech and a bumpkin. And then he moves on to Boswell himself, and it is wonderful. Just wonderful, the way he comes down on the side of his guy. He says, Boswell knew better. A true Scotsman and a true artist, he could play the fool on occasion, and he could profit by his folly. In his dedication to the first and greatest president of the Royal Academy, has had, he anticipates a, great, a good many of Macaulay's objections to his character and deportment, and proves conclusively that if he chose to seem ridiculous, he did so not unwittingly, but with a complete apprehension of the effect he designed and the means he adopted. And really, when it comes to giving Boswell his due as a writer, 
I'm not saying as a, as a lawyer or as a husband or as a son or as a figure about society. I'm saying just as a writer. When it comes to giving Boswell his due as a writer, really you could sum it up to, to it, but with just that one line. Boswell knew better. If he's coming across as a, as a credulous bumpkin, it's because he knew better. It's because he wanted to do that. It's because he was trying to be Watson to his homes. Uh, and also in all of his other works, including the works that don't have anything to do with, with Dr. Johnson. There's a craft to his work. Uh that is singularly absent in the journals. If you rank the journals so, that's what makes the journals so fascinating. I'm sure that Henley wrote about the journals at some point, but he doesn't write about them in this book, unless maybe they weren't known when he was writing this. I'm not 100% not sure of the dates there, but you get that all throughout this book on Lord Byron and George Meredith and uh, uh, George Eliot. Oh my God, there's just, there's quotable, underlinable, highlightable stuff in every single essay here. Collected. Uh, by the author's own impetus. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these things. They would be, they'd be lost in old numbers of these journals where he wrote, which, you know, not many people are going to find them there. Uh, but, so, I, I strongly recommend <laughs> this particular book. Uh, but let's see if we can find uh, Invictus and read it, because it's well worth it. <laughs> it's well worth it. Uh, and it should be easy to find. It's... Uh, it's everywhere. It was once upon a time everywhere. School children memorized it. Yes, there we go. Uh, let me read you Invictus, just so that, I mean, William Ernest Henley would, would grimace just a little. He wasn't much for grimacing. He was a, a, a very optimistic person. Uh, he would grimace that every time his name comes up, even when I'm extolling his virtues as a critic, that we're still going to end by reading Invictus. I'm sure, I'm sure that by the end of his life he hated this poem. But we'll read it anyway because it's just so darn good. And also... When you're talking about the kind of brave stoicism in this poem, I know it, this is, if you're a zillennial, this is falling on deaf ears, but for normal people, if anybody earned the right to write a poem like this, it was him. Uh, so this is, this is Invictus. You know this poem already. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horrors of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So I'll risk, I'll risk the author coming over here for wine and calabones and beating me up, because <laughs> he certainly could have done that. I'll risk that for reading his signature poem in his video. <laughs> so there you go. That is William Ernest Henley. That is, I am, I'm concentrating here on his book that is on my Books About Bookshelf, and that is also squarely in my own profession. I have been toying for years with making just such a collection as this. Not only collecting works from hither, thither, and yon, but also going through and essentially rewriting them, enhancing them, changing them, so that you're not asking the reader who's been following your writing to pay for the same goods twice. That was him to a T. He could be a little prickly in terms of uh, his morality. He was pretty fiercely moral as a person. Uh, it led to uh, fallings out with a couple of literary figures, most famously Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, but he didn't make enemies for long. To know him was to love him. Uh, so uh, that is your Victorian figure for today, your Victober episode for today. It's William Ernest Henley, a uh, man after my own heart. So I'll, well, I'll wrap this up for now. Who knows what I'll encounter tonight? I don't know if this will be every day, but, but uh, I'll wrap this up for now and we'll see who we get to tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.